Uh, my name is Karen Ronning Hall, and I am your neighborhood disaster preparedness evangelist. Tonight, we're going to be talking about food and storage prep for a disaster. And this program tonight is brought to you by Cedar Hills Ready and Quake Up. Our mission is to create caring, connected, and resilient neighborhoods. We are committed to making sure that every neighbor is prepared and has the best chance of survival in the event of a disaster. Uh, we're going to be going through a lot of information in a short period of time, and you may want to take notes. I hope you have your paper and uh, a pen, uh, but don't worry about writing everything down because we make all of this, the slides, the notes from the slides, everything available to you afterwards. In addition to that, we provide um, a free Get Prepared Now booklet. Special thank you to Barbara Bracken and the Twalton Neighborhood Ready Program. Uh, they've provided the original material for this booklet and it covers all kinds of subjects and it's available for you to um, use uh, personally or share with your friends. And thank you to the Cedar Hills Ready Quake Up team. This is our small group of um, very talented uh, enthusiasts uh, and volunteers. They have a lot of background. Last month, we talked about go bags and emergency supplies. And today we're gonna to focus on how to survive in the long haul with a focus on food and cooking in a disaster. Our speaker will be covering the food and water, food and cooking how-tos, hazards to avoid, recipes and practice. So let's introduce Maureen. I am so excited to introduce you to our speaker tonight. Maureen Quinn Lars is highly respected for her professional uh, accomplishments as the Portland Metropolitan Nutrition Education Program Administrator. She's written and co-written numerous articles, including um, and publications, including Seed to Supper, Oregon Food Bank, and OSU Master Gardener Curriculum. She's also won several awards for her work, including first place in State School Wellness Award, an Administrative Leadership Award, and the Community Partnership Aware Cooking Matters Program. She is known statewide for her work with the community partners to change the health of people and the communities where they live, work, and play. We're delighted and honored to have her with us today. Maureen? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about preparedness and also to let you know that I look forward to questions that come up later. Sometimes you'll talk about something you've experienced and then a friend will say, well, what about X? And so uh, next slide, please. I want to give you my contact information immediately. So should you uh, wanna come back to the presentation, you can find it quickly but I'm happy to take questions after the day as well because part of my job is to support Multnomah and Washington County residents in their wellness. Next slide, please. So first I wanna start with the fact that I honor those who have already been through disasters and one never knows who's in the room. And so we all bring our experiences. And so for that, because we're here together, but apart with COVID, I just want to acknowledge that we and our loved ones might already be bringing experience to this. So listen with the, uh, with the knowing that you already have. But today's objectives are gonna be around food related disaster preparedness, including food and water needs, which for those of you who've listened to some of the other presenters, you may say rerun, but it will be brief, but it's so important it needs to be in every presentation. And then we'll talk about making a habit scaffold and then we'll act on some of that, hopefully. And then plan first sometimes, then kit. We need to acknowledge not only economics in general, but the economics of the pandemic. So for those of you who are listening to this, also knowing, hey, I've got family that needs to know this, but their economic times are serious and tight. We're gonna include some information about what might make sense to plan for and then slowly build up to. So I want just to put that out up front because of the times we're in. Next slide, please. So disasters can affect your mental processes. This is our dog Rocco after day seven of the February weather event this year. Dog was not happy with the lack of heat in our home. People may be surprised by their own stress responses. 
So this is why emergency preparedness is so important so that you can practice the behaviors that you think are the most valuable for your getting ready as a way to internalize those most helpful actions during an emergency. So tonight we'll give you some concrete examples of actions you can take and supplies you can organize to get ready. The dog is fine. We spent a lot of time making over him and making sure he was nice and comfortable. But it's just an acknowledgement that the suddenness of some emergencies can change what we think our reactions will be. And so we wanna prepare for that. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the, the view at my house during that same storm in a 41 degree home. So I'd like you to add to the chat if you're inclined to chat or just to think about if you're not in the mood to write, if I got stuck at home right now, what would I enjoy eating without cooking? And then my peers will take a look in the chat and share some answers out for all of us. Breakfast bars, chocolate, <laughs> Powerball bars, chips, chocolate, dark chocolate, canned baked beans, pork and beans, fruit, nuts, jerky, peanut butter sandwich and fruit, some, and uh, ice cream, granola, lasagna, wine, yeah, wine sounds good. <laughs> Tuna. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for getting into the spirit and just telling us some of the things that would sound good and that you would enjoy eating without cooking. Uh, next slide, please. And for those of you who gave us answers in glass jars, just a reminder about storage. Those should be on shelves that have front pieces to keep things where they belong without jumping off in case of an earthquake, or they should be stored in safety boxes. Okay. So Karen shared some of our answers and you all hit some really good basics, things that you can get at with a can opener or just by opening one little wrapper. And that's important. It is really important. There is a strong likelihood that no matter what good yummy thing you put, that you will wish for more variety than you actually have when the moment comes. And so with that um, truth illustrated, uh, but some really excellent examples, but just the fact that you will probably wish for more variety. Let's get down to some recommendations. Next slide, please. We're going to talk about water and food. And we're going to talk about both of them, because without the water, the food part doesn't work out well. Next slide, please. So even though I talked about, um, you know, I was pitched as your, your food presenter, it all starts with water. Now, these are the water recommendations that those of you who are return viewers um, have seen previously, but every viewer needs to know that the water quantity recommendations are conservatively one gallon of water per day minimum for every person, pet, and cooked item you have ambitions to make, such as rice or noodles or lasagna, for a minimum of three days and preferably two to four weeks because that is the likely time that they anticipate we will be without direct services um, from the larger systems that usually help us if there's an emergency. So in my case, there's a partner, a sister, and Rocco the dog along with me. So that's four of us. So four gallons of day minimum for our home times a minimum of three days, a minimum of 12 gallons for the most basic emergency preparedness for our home. That last line in gray, options, purchase, or home packaging is, is the start of what I promised you about ways to think about this in the economic times we're in. If you're a crafty person, um, you'll have some options. If you're a purchaser who just wants to make this be organized and stop having to think about it, um, there'll be some straightforward ways you can do that too. So this is the baseline action. If you're thinking about getting ready, you need to start with water because you're going to be far less secure during an emergency if you don't have the water part taken care of. But with sufficient water, you can move to your cooking feats of excellence. Next slide. So as I mentioned, a gallon of water a day is conservative. So if you know you really like water and you drink a lot of it anyway, you'd be wise to ratchet up your math. But this is the water math for you. So I'm going to be quiet for long enough for you to do this math for your home, please. Count each person and pet. 
imagine how much rice or noodles you would cook daily. Times it by three. And then put that many gallons on your shopping list or your calendar or your phone memo. Right now, ignore this presentation long enough to get it down on somewhere where you can take action. And that is the trick, to tie it to something that makes sense to you. And if you need to step away and go get that list off to your fridge, that's just a dandy action for you to take because someplace along the way, systematizing the things you know is how you get those things to be actions which are supporting you in emergency. Next slide, please. You can see it doesn't need to take up a lot of space if you're just tucking something into a corner of your kitchen, your hall closet, your basement supply corner. Next slide, please. But if you're listening and thinking, I can't afford what's coming, uh, you should know there are options. So perhaps where you live, you have access to the hot water heater. If that's the case, maybe you will prefer learning how to, to uh, turn it off and drain it. And um, this brochure title that you're seeing here, um, this, this um, title, Survival Basics, Tips for Securing a Safe Drinkable Supply, will show you how to drain a hot water heater or what to look for to find the instructions for the model that you've got. And then it will also give you sanitizing information for the amount of water that you're trying to put aside. The Survival Basics brochure also covers um, the municipal water versus well water thing. And it also talks about um, a few other tips about putting the water by, such as if you're using um, plastic containers versus um, glass containers, which they don't super recommend. And then if you're using large containers, like perhaps buying a couple of five gallon buckets that you are using in tandem with your craft project of learning how to turn off your hot water heater. Next slide, please. Stan's gonna drop a link in the chat if he hasn't already done so about that very publication. Um, so by the end, you'll have things you can look through in the chat and choose which things you wanna download for later use. All right, so food and cooking. Next slide, please. Oh, I see Karen would like me to say something about storing water um, containers on concrete because it is the case that plastic, as someone mentioned, can, can degrade after a very short while. And it is even shorter if the plastic is in contact with concrete. There is a tiny little chemical reaction that can occur and depending upon your cement floor, it can go faster. And so it's nice to have a barrier between, if you're, if you're storing things in a cement um, area, it's nice to have a barrier between your plastic containers and that cement floor um, to prolong the life of a plastic that does give out after a while. Thank you for that, Karen. You're welcome. Okay, so federal advice starts with these foods. These ready to eat foods are the baseline part of a lot of the emergency preparedness suggestions. So if you think back to what you all put into the chat, a lot of those lined up very beautifully with the federal advice that we get. Now, I hope you really did take me up on putting things on your phone memo or on your shopping list, but if you didn't, then I hope you will now because the hour that you're investing here, I'm happy to share with you to take actions while you're listening to go do the getting ready part so that the next time you hit the store or the next time you hit the order button, you can get some of these water and food items taken care of. And it is the habit of working on it a little at a time that is often the most successful for people who don't do this for a living. So I will just tell you, if you can identify one or two things that seem doable, then you're heading in the right direction to get it done. So if you notice on the federal guidance, these are, it starts with shelf stable items. It starts with things that are easy to store and that don't need a lot of fuel to make them work out as a dinner, breakfast, or snack item because we don't know how much fuel will be available depending upon the emergencies that hit us. So shelf-stable foods allow you to eat without the stress of cooking. And that's important because some people have a shutting down reaction. Once the emergency actually happens, 
um, once the emergency actually happens, you will perhaps be quite ready to go and all your training will bloom at that very moment. But sometimes people shut down a little bit. And in that case, these shelf-stable items are doubly useful to be able to keep yourself nourished while still dealing with the feelings that the emergency has caused to bloom for you. So a couple of things that you would actually eat from that earlier list um, or from the list here on the screen, those would be another great thing to put on your phone memo or your piece of paper. But for those of you who are still thinking about water and like, well, I'm, I'm still on the first step that you said, which was water. Just know that the brochure that um, Stan's put a link in about will help you decide how to store things. And some of that will be based on your style. So if you're a person that wants things in uniform containers and you know put aside in, in an orderly fashion in a, a box for your preparedness kit, that's one way to do it. For people who, who have glass jars, there's, there's some information on how to store those safely so that it reduces the likelihood of breakage. There are some tips about putting water in your freezer. If you have a biggish freezer and not a biggish amount of food in it, that's another easy place to put some extra water. And it'll, it'll help you with the efficiency of the freezer by keeping the space used up. And it will help you with the efficiency of the freezer by having something in it that's frozen clear through like that water. But then when the time comes that you need it to help you cool the food, it will also assist you in that way. And then if you get some extra stuff, you just take a gallon of water out and you're still ready to go. You've got another, another little square foot of space in there for the yummy thing you got. Next slide, please. So we're now going to talk about cooking sources because depending where you live and, and what your pastimes are, these are some emergency alternatives in, in times of um, surprise um, emergencies. So might be candle warmers. You might do chafing dishes because you're used to preparing a table in that manner. Maybe fondue pots, maybe a fireplace. And the source for all of this is the, the last line on the slide in case people want to follow up on the other um, ready.gov links. That's the, the federal resource space. Next slide, please. So these sources, and especially a fireplace or, or camp stove, are two important things because of the gases that can be in your space. So there's some other cooking sources like a camp stove, gas stove, wood stove, wood stoves with cast iron pots or skillets, which can withstand the heat, a barbecue, or maybe a fire pit. Again, you'd want to use something like a Dutch oven that can really take that intense heat. But I need to talk about the dynamic tension about indoor air quality and cooking sources, because if you have a gas stove already, unless the earthquake was the emergency that we're up against, you will probably have access to using that stove for things like heating water, rice, lasagna noodles, as were mentioned earlier. But the home consumer's got to decide and there is a real dynamic tension between the indoor air quality change, lowering effect from gas stoves and the utility of them in some emergencies. Um, the news out of Texas during the last bad weather event down there was very clear that indoor gas stoves were part of how people coped with cooking during that. If you picked wood stove, cooking inside the box is not recommended. Uh, you really want to practice cooking on the top surface of the wood stove prior to your emergency, or there is a high likelihood that burned food will be part of your repertoire. And then if you picked gas, um, excuse me, barbecue, gas or charcoal, there's a strong case to be made for keeping an extra full um, container of fuel, whatever fuel that is, at your house. I, I want to go back to one thing I didn't finish saying about air quality. When you're setting up a heat source, you want to make very sure that if it's one that generates carbon monoxide, that it is not close to your house, it's not in your house, it's not in your garage, it's not in your garage with an open door, it's not near windows to your house, it's to the side. 
Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is a real deal. You might have the grace to get a really bad headache from it or really, really red cheeks, but often people are overcome by the gas and fall into unconsciousness with not enough warning. And so the thinking about how you're going to cook also needs to come with how far am I willing to walk out of this house to cook if I'm really not supposed to be putting the darn thing in my garage. So that is another sort of logistics issue that you have to hit. Next slide, which brings us to location, location, location. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go back to this idea of avoiding cooking danger. Charcoal grills and camp stoves are for outdoor use only. And the temptation when you are freezing is to think that that ironclad regulation uh, is just very cold regulation if your emergency is a stormy weather event. But it's important to know that that odorless gas is a big side effect danger during emergencies. So it gets its own boring slide just so that you know how strongly I feel about it and how strongly the safety professionals feel about it. Next slide, please. So distance is safety. Place grills and camp stoves away from the house. And here's the thing, with the wind, even if you're this far away from the house or under the overhang, you know how air happens to move. It's, it's a flexible situation. You can't just say, I'd like all of the off-gassing from this to go down the driveway away from the house. And so poison gas can move through wall vents, through doors, through open or closed doors that just have a little crack. And generators need to stay away and outside too. So it, it is another thing to consider that if you're gonna cook hot things with, with food source, with heating sources that um, give off gases or run a generator that's gonna help you with what's going on in your house, that generator has to be away from the house, away from the windows, not in the garage. Boring, rain covered, yes, possibly, but then not um, interacting with carbon monoxide, which is the bigger danger. You'll like the trip because then your yummy food will be out there in your yard. Next slide, please. This slide is just to really illustrate that when the power's out, lights and TV don't work, candles, books, and wind up Blocks are going to be important or um, solar utilities are going to be important. Whatever it is that you value in the domain of low tech, you're going to want to make sure that's in your home. And this also brings us to the fact that if your emergency has cut the electric, there is an order of operations for how to run through your food so that you're able to use your resources in the best manner possible. Next slide, please. So for recipes that sound like a good idea during emergencies, you should practice them ahead. There are a couple of schools of thought on recipes. If you're cooking things that you love and you always have those ingredients on hand, then that kit is ideal because you know the stuff will be in your home when it's time to um, respond to your emergency and figure out the cooking of, of the main meal. But think about what you'd cook when you're stressed, because if you have just had a giant emergency happen, you may not be in your best cooking moments. So if you could think about food that you want to cook or want to eat when you're in distress, those would be other items to add to that phone memo or shopping list, because there is a real, um, a real opportunity for you to do just what your training has afforded you and, and cook that great meal. But it's also possible, again, that your stress response, um, you won't have time to cook because you'll be helping the other people that you love deal with the fact that this is a big fat emergency. So the order of operations for using up food is refrigerator first, then the freezer, and then your shelf stable items. So you'll need to use up those treasured refrigerator items early in the limited time before they go bad. So 
So next slide, please. So this is the order of use slide, just in case um, those of you who are more visual learners, so you get the same, same information. So that first, that first food use is gonna be what's in the refrigerator because um, the food stability of it can decline quickly, especially if your emergency occurs in the summer when the outdoor heat is gonna affect how long food stays stable. And foodborne illness becomes another real concern, especially for some key audiences. So little children, pregnant women, older adults, and those with vulnerable medical conditions. Um, and those would be things that affect the immune response. So if you're having chemo, if you have an autoimmune disorder, if you have arthritis, an autoimmune disorder example. So the prevention of the foodborne illness is going to come in part with strategy as you work through that fridge and in part with ruthlessness. When in doubt, throw it out. So when in doubt, throw it out sounds awful, but if you're in the middle of an emergency and then you get a bad stomach or something worse, uh, you, you have to weigh your ability to maintain your best health during that emergency. So again, refrigerator foods first. And foodsafety.gov has a couple of charts that can help you figure out the length of time you might have with the foods that would most likely be in your refrigerator. So they have a chart full of a lot of different examples. And if you just take a look at them and say, I don't need anything in this category, but these are the things that I do have and take a look at how long they would likely last, that will help you sort of imagine what those first meals might be like. That way you can do a little bit of it before the emergency. So again, I think Stan already shared it, but, or one of the essential members of the team already shared, foodsafety.gov. And then next slide, please. We should have an example of what one of the charts look like. So you can see it's, it's not too rough to look through and it, the foods are categorized. And I just used the protein example because that's some of the, um, it's some of the high cost per unit food in a store. So held above 40 degrees Fahrenheit for more than two hours. We've all perhaps had a sandwich for lunch or dinner that, that passed this number. In an emergency, you might have a whole fridge full of those things. Mm. And your inclination will be very strong not to waste that quantity of food because it's miserable. And if you've been careful in your resources and have a lovely variety of food in your fridge, it will be a rough decision to consider. However, if you've thought through, I am definitely using up these valued and expensive or value and preciously made by precious people products first, then you'll have a way to triage what's in that fridge of yours to get it onto a plate in good time while it's still safe. All right, let's see here. There's also another one on frozen foods. And so if you're on the website, there's, you can just toggle between frozen and fresh. The kind of disaster will matter to your planning also. So a hot season will speed up, as I was saying, the rate of food loss. And if you're in a cold season, maybe you can use some of that clean snow inside of a clean bag and use it to pack the food that's in your freezer to get it to last a little longer. And we won't, of course, have that luxury in the summer, but it is a way to proceed. All right, next slide, please. Insulated cooking uses the heat of the food being cooked to complete the cooking process. And the foods are heated to the boiling point and then put into a beautiful insulated container that you have already made so that the heat inside of the food continues to cook the product. And that is a fuel saving, um, a fuel saving strategy. So this example has um, this, this has an example of a natural fiber quilt or sheet wrapped around uh, things such as uh, quilting batting if you're a quilter, newspapers, straw, if you're a gardener, you might have that. You want to take care to keep the food well over 140. If it's boiling, you know you hit it. 
But for other things, that they should be steaming hard before you put them in the insulated container. And then due to their ability to hold heat, things like this thick aluminum pan or a Dutch oven will be two other pieces of cooking equipment that allow you to have a little variety. And if, if you're really being thoughtful about fuel use, you know, maybe you live in an apartment where you really can't stack up a bunch of fuel, then this might be a strategy having a, a thick sided, thick bottomed cooking pot with a tight lid and you might be able to conserve some fuel that way. All right, next slide, please. So you've gotten a whole bunch of information from me, but when, oh, when can you process it? Well, how about now? So we're going to think about your first meal. Will you be taking a few ingredients out and heating them? If you're just not in the mood for, for cooking with this emergency, or will you be launching your first food kit and just taking out the little set of things that you had put aside for this? Or will you be saying, oh, I know exactly what's in that fridge that I wanna use, quickly removing it and shutting the door again and making that first um, protein or vegetable protein meal from your refrigerator. Think about with what you've heard so far would likely be the case at your home. And then if somebody, um, if some of you would be willing to put some of your ideas in the chat based on what you've heard so far, what you think you might do about a meal, I'd appreciate it. We've got um, fresh veggies and sandwiches and cottage cheese, hummus and yogurt, chili, salad and cheese, whatever meat I have in the fridge and, can op and a can of green beans, uh, plenty of leftover. We always have plenty of leftovers that we currently eat for lunch anyway. Uh, cheese, scrambled eggs, whatever's in the fridge, beer. Ooh, that sounds good, Lincoln. Uh, Kathy is saying cheese and lunch meat, uh, another scrambled eggs, butter, sandwiches, leftovers, lasagna. <laughs> Stan wants lasagna. I'm sure Stan has put aside enough water to be able to successfully complete a lasagna launch at his place. Um, we got talking about lasagna as we were planning this and we just couldn't let it go. So uh, but I wanna say that you've all put in some things that make a lot of sense. So you've, you naturally are gravitating to things that'll work very well in an emergency. So nicely done. Uh, oh, Annie's saying Costco lasagna doesn't need water. Well done if it's in your fridge, but if it's in your freezer, don't use it yet because you wanna keep your freezer slammed shut. So you're gonna be in great shape because you can have lasagna more than once. Um, let's and see here. Somebody suggested, um, Christy Thomas suggested powdered green drink. I've never heard of that. That sounds interesting. It does sound yummy. So thank you very much for participating because crowdsourcing ideas for when we're not maybe going to be at our best is a great way to help one another to succeed during the tough times. And of course, if you're following some of the other emergency guidance, you'll be out checking on your vulnerable neighbors and making sure of people being set with the supplies they need and making sure that they're safe. And so those first meals will probably also be done with an eye to not too many leftovers because your best skill will be opening the fridge, getting your materials out quickly and shutting it so that you're able to maintain the coolness in there as long as you can. Um, Next slide, please. So because we talked about lasagna before, I also wanted to share with you quick lasagna. So the Food Hero website is a website that uses Oregon fruits and vegetables and other foods that are easily available in most of Oregon and provides economical recipes. There are also ways to look at, um, down in the next part below this slide would be the part that explains not only how to cook it, but a nutrition label if you needed to look at one. But the idea is that the recipes are available for reasonable price proportion. And so the other thing I wanted to bring up is that if you are having to juggle how to get ready, how to make your plan and how to prepare the materials for your emergency preparedness, one way to 
reorganize a piece of the funding for that is to take a look at economical eating and reducing food waste and using the savings from that for your other financial goal of emergency preparedness. And so the recipes on Food Hero might go very nicely with some foods that you already have in your home. So that would help you to prepare food economically by using the things that are already in your inventory. And also because it's lasagna, it meets our needs in the planning group because we wanted to have a lasagna recipe too. So next slide, please. I will also say that there is a spinach lasagna recipe on the Food Hero website. So if you just look up foodhero.org, it's divided into main meals, breakfast meals, and you might find something in there that requires very little preparation that would work also in your emergency plan, you think. And so you could try it ahead of time to see if it merited being a part of the supplies that you used in your longer term planning. So this recipe page is another example of something you would find on the foodhero.org website. It's important because it uses common ingredients and on the days uh, where you don't have a whole lot of access to new materials, it may be the case that some of these staple materials could be used in more than one way. The example of the cranberry oat balls has a little smiley kid approved button on it. And that means that we have served it to a lot of children and that over 70% of the kids wanted to tell their grownups about it or, or voted yes on the flavor of the recipe. And I will say in this recipe, it calls for peanut butter, but it, um, you can substitute other nut butters and the texture will just change a little bit. Um, I've had it with a couple different nut butters that are pretty good. The one caveat, no honey for kids under a year old. So if you're planning for little kids to help you with the food during an emergency, just make sure that you keep the honey out of the, out of the food stream for people under a year old. And this is an example of just another way you could use a, a shelf stable oat product in more than one thing. Next slide, please. So I want to include a comment about cooking in cans because the federal emergency management um, agency talks about this exact topic. And I think it is important to bring up because it's not something that non-campers may do, but it's worth knowing because every time you cook something, you're going to have to clean a pan or decide not to. And so a can of fresh chili, maybe a fresh salad, from, uh, I should say a can of chili and a fresh salad, something in your fridge and maybe a dessert from a can as well, would help you to have at least one meal that you could at least partly pop open. So this is maybe where breakfast or dinner items come in using up some of your milk before it's out of safe temperature. But I wanted to at least show you these FEMA instructions to heat food in a can because that's one less dish if you've got a can of something that you can heat this way. So remove the label, thoroughly wash and disinfect the can and uh, many kitchens already are doing some kind of one part bleach to 10 parts water for periodic cleaning of the kitchen anyway. And then, and if you work in a restaurant, you're definitely used to the sanitation step. Then open the can before heating and away you go. Though it seems basic, this can cooking might be an important part of how you get organized during an emergency and it'll keep you from washing a dish with that water that you've taken care to purchase. So over the course of an emergency, this is just a reasonable strategy to have in your toolkit. Next slide, please. So what have you prepared during this hour? As this information has flowed by you or perhaps over you in your comfy chair, what, what pieces seem to be the most supportive of the home life that you're living right now. And if you're comfortable, would you please share it in the chat so I can get a sense of that before we start um, addressing some question and answer information. Maureen, um, one person doesn't understand the question. And let me just look at what people are saying. Here. Oh, thank you for thank you for that. Sometimes I get so nervous. I, I'm just trying to gauge what people have heard that was the most pertinent 
because often in these conversations, some people are in apartments, some people are in houses, some people have, you know, two generators. So my question is just about what part of this was helpful to you and maybe sharing um, something that you're going to do to get ready. Thanks for asking. The things that people are saying um, include the order of using up food, uh, need to get a Dutch oven, like the food use charts, I uh, need to focus on foods that I can eat without heating, um, fondue and how to use a can, thinking about how much water my family may need um, and how much water we use per day for cooking. Um, I'm gonna check out the survival basics at OSU and foodhero.org. Uh, recipe book for reminding of easy cooking meals. Uh, check out candle warmers of Diane Smith, overnight oatmeal. I have aquatainers sitting on my garage floor. I assume they would be okay since they are thicker, but I don't know if this is still a problem. You and your aquatainers should be fine. And thank you for making that distinction between the far less durable ones that we pick up at the store and the very durable containers that are designed for longer term storage and withstanding the daily slings and arrows of outrageous uh, garage storage. Somebody, David Gardner asked, um, cooking in the can, aren't the insides of cans plastic coated? Not all of them. And you are raising an excellent point um, David Gardner. So, um, so some can linings are coated. And if they're things like tomato sauce, it's largely to keep the tomatoes from tasting like can that that acid interaction that'll happen. Uh, my strong advice is for everyone on this call to take David's excellent point and take a look at the foods that you're planning to keep in storage and look at the insides of them. It on some of them, it'll say not lined or no BHA in the lining. I mean, um, if you are reading your cans. But for emergency preparation, the easiest thing to do is decide to eat something once before the emergency and then note, is that a lined can? And then maybe look for, if it's not, you're set. And if, if it is, then decide, okay, I want to eat this and I am willing to pour it into something else. Um, a good point. Yeah, the BPA, right. So bisphenol. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Other questions that someone mentioned the survival basics at OSU. And thank you for that. There is also a six hour course that people can take on the Cascadia subduction zone preparedness that is far more than just food. And if you are interested in that, it is available without cost. It has some simulations like what all would tip over and, and what your view would be like. Um, for those of us who have balance issues, that was a remarkable experience, but, but really important too. And my colleagues who are just so knowledgeable, you know, also included the water publication that I referenced earlier and then they have different scenarios so that you can get very specific about the most economical way to obtain your water and then um, cooking strategies and um, a whole gamut. And I, I'm happy to follow up with anyone who is interested in that. Or you can just, I, the last time I got it, I don't know, um, I'm happy to follow up with anyone or simply send the link to Karen so that you'll all have it available through through the neighborhood work here. Let's see here. How would you like me to proceed with the questions that came before and now? Well, let me let me let's um, let me do my last bit here, uh, oh, and then of that'll give Stan a minute to kind of go over anything that came up that didn't get answered, uh, and provide those as well. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Maureen. This was oh, awesome. Sure. Um, and I, before we, uh, in the next few days, as I mentioned before, I'll send uh, everyone a follow-up email that will include the links to the information and recipes um, so you guys can take some further action. And uh, we will also have links to a couple of disaster recipe booklets um, in addition to what 
uh, what Maureen has been talking about. The one shown in this photo is produced by the American Public Health Association. We have also have a wonderful little recipe booklet submitted by our neighbor who's actually on this call right now, Carol Frankel. And she lives in Beaverton and attends our meetings frequently. So it uh, it actually kind of gave me an idea. <laughs> and it, if we want to, as a, as a neighborhood, uh, crowdsource a disaster recipe booklet from uh, that would be very cool. The guidelines would be something like uh, the recipe would uh, would be you know made from shelf stable ingredients and requires no cooking or very little cooking using uh, cooking sources that don't require electricity. Um, the simple to assemble and clean up, just a few ingredients, steps, cooking utensils and pots and so forth. Um, it's a great idea. But I, my team has said, we would need some additional help to get that done. So if you are excited about that idea, um, let me know, because it would be awesome to, um, to have something uh, for our extended neighborhood, not just Cedar Hills, but everybody. So moving on to the next slide there. Um, so I just wanted to do a little quick advertisement for next month's meeting. And the topic is going to be how to win friends and survive a disaster, nine steps to neighborhood preparedness. Um, please note that we are shifting our meetings to the fourth Wednesday evenings of the month. Um, if a natural disaster strikes, your survival may depend on your neighbors because emergency services will be overwhelmed. Your best chance of survival is be, to be surrounded by people who are knowledgeable and prepared people who have your back and know what you uh, know what to do. Your neighbors are your first responders. Uh, so why wait for a disaster to get connected? And in this meeting, you'll learn the nine steps to take after disaster. You'll get to know some of your neighbors. It's going to be very interactive. We're going to have um, breakout rooms and uh, where you can strategize and you'll just learn how easy it is to um, set up your neighborhood and getting get it organized. Um, and that's going to be uh, 7 p.m. Wednesday, May 26th. Uh, and everyone, as usual, is welcome. And the URL is right there on the page. It's uh, tinyurl.com, Cedar Hills Ready. That's C-H-R-M-Y-N 5-26-21. And so now we do our Q&A. Uh, I'd like to turn this over to Stan and Maureen uh, to answer the questions that people have. Um, take it away. And you know what? Uh, I'll leave this slide up for just a few minutes as it ha if you want to take a photograph of it um, so you can sign up right away. I think actually Stan may have put the URL for this uh, meeting in the chat. And if not, we will. Uh, and then I'm going to shut this down so we can see each other's faces. Okay, Stan, Maureen, how would you like to proceed? There was a Tamara who wrote in, how do I stock food for a ketogenic diet? As anybody is thinking about how to prepare for an emergency, a look at what you eat commonly and what you eat sort of infrequently is, is worth comparing that list to a shopping list of things that could sit for three months. And so the foods that could sit for three months, then you can slowly work them into that daily, that daily food plan and then have a, a fresh, a fairly fresh rotation of things for when there's an emergency. And a part of that is also reading um, the labels of the stuff you get to see if they, if they are shelf stable for that longer than one month time. If they're not, you have to really look at your daily eating pattern and, and how quickly you want to rotate things because there's a knack to it. And if you don't pay attention, you don't want to waste food or money just because one week was very busy. So looking at the foods that are used frequently and then the foods that are used infrequently and try to get the longest storage of those things and a, and a profile of several of the things from both of those categories is a great place to start right after water. Good. Uh, Les asked, uh, how do you recommend transitioning to a preparedness culture 
with a two week, no power, food ready household. Like that's the gold standard. FEMA <laughs> employees are doing that. So just the fact that you're attending to it with your kids and talking about and normalizing trying new foods, I'd say is a very strong strategy because in an emergency, someone may offer something wholesome to you if you've had a terrible refrigerator emergency. And, and having your kids with a little bit more open willingness to try new foods during the good times with us makes it a little easier on them when they're stressed out and not at their best, just like us during an emergency. I will say that if you are in a position to afford it, buying a little extra of some shelf stable foods and putting them by is a good, a good strong step, putting them in a place where they're not going to fall down and get all dented up. If there's an earthquake, another strong step. Um, the practice of the practice of eating things and using them up is another thing that doesn't seem like it's related to emergency preparedness, but it really is because it reduces the family's overall waste footprint. And then fewer resources are being wasted. So you have a little bit more money to put aside for those emergency supplies. So the transition is about where's money leaking out now? How can I tighten that up and then use that for resources to be shelf stable during an emergency? Because they are often a little bit more expensive. Not always, but often. And I just really appreciate all of you being here. And I'm, I'm trying to share things that will be relevant to many, but I just appreciate that the interest that you have brought to the room will just be part of what really helps during an emergency, that your own heart is open to being part of the solution. We had a question about um, uh, one of the pictures that we had showed a pantry that didn't have pr protective strips in the front of the food on the shelf. So I just want to say, if any of you are storing glass where it could fall down and break, um, the protective strips on the fronts of cupboards, which sometimes are just even doweling, are part of what's really important to think about if everything in your house was shaking, what would you not want to have fall down from where it is right now? And if you just sort of squint and do a 360 around your kitchen shelves, that will become obvious quickly. What's glass up high? Stan, what questions remain? Uh, well, there was another uh, comment in the chat that kind of follows this particular question. And, and, and it, uh, uh, Diane says, uh, check out candle warmers. And there are other things that can be also utilized. Um, going blank on the name of the of the uh, canned uh, heating things that like for, for the warm chafing dishes, uh -huh. right? Yeah, that can be for warming. I mean, it won't cook, but at least it'll warm it up, and that are safe within a house hold, uh, which is different than the camp stoves or the barbecues or everything CD's else. saying you mean sterno right yeah sterno thank you thank you uh, thank you cd so, so those are you know so that i think those are a nice follow-up to the um uh what uh, you, you answered there and then uh let's see what's the other there was a follow-up too with this um do you recommend transitioning from a just-in-time stop at the grocery store meal preparation household relying on others? Getting to know your neighbors is kind of important now, isn't it? <laughs> yes, and also um, you can be a just-in-time at the store household. However, your household would probably feel more secure and prepared if in addition, that and also part happened that when you opened um, the, the storage cupboard or the dark closet that's good for longer term storage of stable foods, um, that there were a few things in there. So that you have that balance between, hey, we're spontaneous all the time about these things and we've got 28 days worth of water or at least five um, as a strong start because it is a drag to suddenly have the heat go off for a week and then think, ooh, and I'm a little light on water. I mean, fortunately, that's not the position that our neighbors were in when we went to check on them, but we live on a hill. It was just a big, giant, icy popsicle. 
So if, you know, if it were icy out, would you really want to go drag a big box of groceries home? No. Even if you were doing it for your favorite neighbor, it's just easier to have some of it in the closet at the house ready. So we had um, so a question from Lincoln up there um, about gardening. Do you see that one, Stan? I'm trying to get uh, back. Any sources? Yeah, any top resource comments regarding gardening and foraging in a disaster that you love? Thank you so much for everything else in this presentation. Lincoln, I don't, and I appreciate the question a lot because in general with the pandemic, we're really emphasizing people trying to do some local food, whether it's a row of greens or a container of, of um, just how to reduce that travel load and logistics problem with food if we can do anything to do with growing some of it locally. But I don't, and if, if you'd like, I'd be happy to follow up about that and try to get some information back towards Karen for for the send out um, email that she'll do as a follow-up. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, CD Nelson is suggesting that everybody have three can openers scattered around your near garage. <laughs> he says, that's important. Um, you can, I think it's also important to have them in your um, go bag. Uh, so that's a good idea. Also, Cindy, uh, I'm not going to attempt the last name. She says she moved here from Austin in 2019 and is still in touch with all of her neighbors there in, uh, via Facebook. And it was really great how they all helped each other out during the big freeze. Um, Whitney had a question about how long can you safely store tap water in a plastic container? Oh, my friends cover that in their their brochure. And I do not remember off the top of my head. But um, Stan, that was one of the things you stuck in the... Um, in the chat, right? I think it was, I think it was page four in the, they, it seemed like it was in the middle. Hmm. We will find out. Okay. And then while we're waiting for that, uh, Trish uh, asked her, th that asked if the speaker could say something about the glass bottles she couldn't hear. Oh, sorry about the dropout. Um, if the question was about Storing in water, storing water in them, uh, it's just a little bit more delicate operation. You got to keep track of um, them not breaking, and then your your supply going away. But if that's something cheap that you have now, um, that can work. Yeah, that can absolutely work. And then uh, let's see here. That previous question, I'm going to need a little bit of help because I am now looking for the answer to the other one tap water in what was the question again water storage containers tap water in water storage containers yeah and plastic how long can you safely store tap water in a plastic container okay well so there are different kinds of plastic so that's sort of an important uh distinction repurposed milk jugs no uh other bottled water maybe every six months in um commercially bottled water, that's, that's the gold standard. But the best option is to use, and I'm quoting here, the best option is to use food grade, heavy duty plastic buckets, carboys, or um, drums stamped with peat or HDPE. And the, and the plastic is because some of it's really permeable. So it looks like plastic that things don't get through, but it in fact has, um, it does not have a smooth surface and it is not sufficiently thick to, so that when you wash it, that it stays all the way clean and then, um, and then it degrades. So that is, that is why their brochure is, it is, it's a 10 minute read, but it'd be worth it in my opinion. And I'd be happy to follow up with you. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, CD Nelson is saying one of his favorite non-standard foods are to buy 10, number 10 cans from August. Augustine's Farms, huh? They have uh, pancake mix and dehydrated potato slices and a few others are all under 10 bucks and they last for 10 years or more. And he uses them a lot and while he rotates. That's a pretty good tip. Hmm. And then it also said uh, you can grow lettuce and spinach pretty much all year round. Right. And so if, if you're in a place that has 
decent soil. Or, and if you're in an apartment, you, you have to check whether you're allowed to have a container garden. But those things will even grow in a grocery bag if you've poked half a dozen holes in the bottom of one of those plastic reusable grocery bags and fold it down so it's only about a third of its original height. You can actually start lettuce in that and then um, and use it instead of terracotta pots to reduce some of the weight on your balcony. Stan, any other questions? No, if you do, you've got my contact information. I'm happy to follow up and I've just really appreciated all of you tonight. Thank you so much, Maureen. We really appreciated you. Uh, everybody, a little you know, clap for her. Thank you fun. for coming, everybody. Yeah, this was awesome. And thank you for, uh, and hope to, hope to see you next month. <laughs>